Many of the counselors that are here tonight, well, a couple of us plan on going to the, the hockey game today. So the girls' ice hockey game for Burlington, um, they're in the second round of the playoffs. It starts at 7.30, so I just wanted everyone to know we plan to be as, you know, as quick and informative as possible. So I just wanted to give everyone a heads up on that. <clears throat> Again, my name is Joe Adamato. I'm the director of counseling at the high school. And tonight is geared for students and parents um, that have students in grade nine or 10. Um, we've been doing this, this particular event oh, for about seven or eight years now. Previous to that, we offered um, you know, a college planning night for senior parents, and then we offered um, an academic planning night for our students in grade nine, 10, and 11. But what we found over the years is where students are in high school and with their academics and college planning and things like that, we decided to separate and add yet a third night. Uh, but the reason is because we feel that junior year versus freshman, sophomore year, um, the focal points are a little bit different uh, where students are at. And so we did split those up. Again, any parents welcome to attend any of our events that we host. Uh, but we really felt like having something focused for students and parents in grade 9 and 10 were, uh, were important for us as, as a department. So I just wanted to make sure we did some intros. Uh, not every counselor is here tonight. We split up the different events throughout the course of the year. But again, I'm Joe Adubato, the Director of Counseling and a school counselor here. This is Liesl Smith, she's also a school counselor. Um, Emily Minty, also a school counselor. And in the back, we have uh, Gloria Otazic. So each counselor tonight is going to uh, discuss a different aspect of, of this process. Um, again, the goal of this is to just share information so uh, students and parents can make informed decisions. And please keep in mind you're getting kind of a bird's eye view of, of this process. We don't usually have a two hour meeting with a student in the auditorium like this. We're kind of doing these things over the course of, you know, a couple of months, a couple of years. And so again, this is more of a summary of what we do. So tonight we're gonna to talk a little bit about academic planning. How many parents have heard of SCORE? A couple, all right. How many parents have heard of Naviance? All right, so we had a long standing for about a decade here, a college software program called Naviance. We've now moved to uh, a program called SCORE, which, which we've been using now. This is our second year. Again, it's a platform for college planning and also career uh, planning as well. And we're gonna talk again about some career exploration. This isn't a college planning night, but we are gonna get into some basics of what colleges look at in terms of uh, students. We'll talk a little bit about stress and anxiety and, and how we manage that. And then we'll have uh, an opportunity for questions and answers. So one of the things we, we like to discuss at our evening events is just most academic areas in the, in the school, um, all our uh, different departments, math, English, history, they all have a curriculum that they follow from year to year. All right, they also try to identify um, entry points at each grade level in terms of how they work with students and what they're trying to achieve at each grade level. So in the counseling realm, we have something called a developmental model. And this is something that mo you know, most public school counseling departments, uh, private schools as well, all have different expectations that they try to achieve at each grade level with students. And it's pretty, uh, this is kind of a broad overview of what we try to do at each grade level. I think some of these things overlap, whether it be from grade, uh, the post-secondary exploration, again, can be done sooner, but over the years we've found the junior year is, is really the year to, uh, to, to do that. So it just kind of spells out what we do on our website. We really uh, hone in on each year and kind of the steps and things that we do each year uh, with students. So we like parents to be aware of that. All right, now we're gonna jump right over to Ms. Wojtasek, who actually has a daughter playing tonight in the game, so she definitely wants to leave ASAP. Would you say that? Hello, everybody, thank you for coming. How many grade nine parents? Oh, wow. How many grade 10? Okay, that's awesome. Thank you so much for coming. So I'm gonna, all this information obviously is in your handout, and uh, 
please raise your hand. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer them along the way. Everybody hear me okay? Okay, great. So begin to define your future plans. We're starting course selection. I know it's been a very stressful time. Um, a lot of folks are trying to have all the answers. And I think what we want these years to be is exploratory. We want you to have a plan if, you know, look ahead, however, to know that you don't have to have all the answers right now. So um, given, you can give certainly a thought to your college major. We say it's never too soon to start visiting. I always say to people, if you're going somewhere, you're going to New Jersey to visit family, go around, drive it through a couple of schools, start thinking about it. And if you get to, you know, to go to, go to on some tours, feel free to do that. But just to start thinking, what would I want to do in the future? Go to the next one. Okay, academic planning. So learn the sequence of courses offered in BHS. We have an incredible um, BHS. Actually, district overall has a wonderful website, but the high school specifically, our program of studies is online. It's also um, all our, our core sequences, for example, for math, for science. You see the pathways. All the information is very accessible. And it's important to kind of, if you're looking ahead to get, for example, you're thinking about taking calculus, how do I get there? What are the courses that I need to get there? So we talk, I mentioned course selection. How many of you have heard course selection is happening? Hopefully you've had some conversations. Awesome, wow, grade nine, grade 10. <laughs> Um, so we started meeting with our students this week and we're going to be meeting next week. We, this is a month-long process and in this, in this time frame um, students are talking to their teachers. The teachers made recommendations and they have one-on-one -on -one meetings and the teachers let them know why they're recommending a certain level. So we work on this. We have then our individual meetings with the kids and then we actually post the courses. But it is a process. It can be changed throughout the spring. We just want to try to finalize it as, as soon as we can. But it is flexible in some ways. But I think what I want to assure to you is that we're having conversations about the courses throughout the, the whole month. Preparing for graduation. So as we talk to the students, we always want to keep in mind that we have four years of English, four years of mathematics, three years of science, three years of social studies, two years of world language. And again, these are the minimum requirements. And then we talk a little bit about exploratory credits. Students need to have what we call elective credits, which would be a full year class is five credits or a half a year class is two and a half. So for example, a lot of first year students took maybe intro to marketing or exploring computer science. Those are full year classes, so that'll be five credits. And then if you, you need two of those, so a total of 10 in whatever combination, five or two plus two and a half plus two and a, plus two and a half, by the time you graduate, okay? So if first, for example, your sophomores, if they are putting off an exploratory for another class, they just have to make sure they take that junior or senior year. And then all of this adds up to a minimum of 110 credits. Most students have way over that, but the minimum for Burlington High is 110 credits. In addition to the credits, the courses, we also need to pass the MCAS graduation requirement. So additional opportunities as we get into, so, into actually um, so, some sophomore classes, but junior and senior year more, more prevalent, we have what we call dual enrollment classes. Have you heard about dual enrollment? No? Okay. Yes? Some, some yes, some no. So dual enrollment is an opportunity for students to get credit, high school credit, as well as college credit. We have some relationships with Middlesex Community College, UMass Boston, LaSalle, I think that's, that's pretty, much, pretty much it for now, right? So it allows students to get credits in two institutions, and when they train, when, if they go on to a post-secondary setting, they can get credit for that for most places. Then we also have virtual courses. So we've had students that they've had some conflict and they weren't able to take a certain course, or they were really interested in uh, taking something different that we don't offer. And they could take a virtual course, and that's something we talk to them individually because it is all online, so it takes a really, um, unique set of skills because it's all independent work and the teacher could be somewhere else. They could be in Alaska. So you got to make sure you communicate with them regularly. So those are conversations we have later on. 
And going back to MCAS, unfortunately we do have to th still think about it, but if things go well and your students pass their MCAS, their freshman year for science and sophomore year for English and mathematics, they're done and they don't have to think about it. If for some reason something doesn't go well and we need to retest, we have time to do that as well, as long as we get the, the testing complete by, by senior year. Using SCORE or SQUIRE, some people say that, we call it SCORE. This is our college planning site, but we also do um, career you know, searches, and this is hopefully something that your students will start, start talking to you about. This is the system that we use to actually send our school records to colleges. You as parents will have the ability to have your own um, access to it, and the students will have their access. So I believe in the back, if you like, if you haven't received, I don't think uh, freshman parents have received an invitation yet, right? Have they? Uh, not if they've been to any of these events. But okay. Just... So if you'd like to fill out the form and leave it with us, we're happy to connect you. And um, we are going to be doing career interest assessments, and all grade 10 students will be able to complete this at some time this year. And the sophomores will be invited, the freshmen will be invited. Yep, through, through an email. Through an email, through their school email. <laughs> so how is it accessed? I think um, students, will, again, will have their, it's, it's an online platform. They can ask some students download the app to their phone, and most of them use it in their iPad. You can access it through this, through this link, and we have it actually a link on our counseling links um, resource page. So they're given initial registration and a password. And um, again, when you sign up, you can, you can also see, you can start looking at schools and you can start looking at um, careers. It's a really nice platform. And, uh, and again, we're happy to connect you with that as, as the years continue. We'll go to the next. Career exploration. So again, we're gonna use um, SCORE. But I really, I think a lot of us like this. I don't know if you've heard about 16 personalities. It's a really cool tool. You take the assessment and over time, like every month or so, it sends you information about, you know, based on your personality profile, these are some areas of interest for you. So it's just good to start thinking, what are my strengths? What are some areas that I want to pursue? And sometimes it's just as important to know what you don't like. Okay, enrichment opportunities. So again, our, our website has a link, especially as we start thinking of end of the year, kids are asking us, well, what should we do for the summer? I think if you have the ability to, if you're staying local and would like to volunteer or to do enrichment programs, we have resources on our site. We, you know, we always say it's, it's a great experience for every young person to have a job. I know it's sometimes it's really hard for 14 and 15 year olds to get jobs. Um, a lot of times we're looking for 16 plus, but job shadowing is, is a really, it's a great opportunity to talk to people in the field. I always say, you know, if you want to be an accountant, what does an accountant do? Do you have an idea what that is? You know, and, and if you have family members, please go, you know, ask them if you could just shadow for a couple hours, talk to them about their job. And um, again, this is, this is available through our website, and maybe we can show them the link later on. I know that was a lot of information, so um, can I answer any questions? No? Yes? So we do have, uh, sophomores have the ability to take one AP course if they're recommended, but just one AP course. In the, and, and that's a conversation you, you could certainly talk to, to, to your child's counselor, but usually it would be AP Bio, and um, sometimes students are interested in um, AP com Computer Science or AP U.S. History. That's junior and senior year for AP English. Sure. Any other questions? Yeah. So the, the science department specifically has created a science opportunities for, for enrichment options for internships. Certainly we can discuss it with the students and we've sent, um, we actually in our Google Classrooms and put a lot of postings that come our way. It is a very detailed process. So once the information is out there, we ask the students to look into it to apply and then if they need support from us, for example, transcripts and oftentimes recommendations, 
to please let us know. But I, I that is, um, you're right, it's becoming a lot more prevalent who students are looking into that. So we've shared a lot of opportunities, but right now it seems to be more STEM focused, but I think as things progress, a lot of kids are looking for that. Um, but right now, I think it, most of the time is, is typically STEM geared. So the science department has created a science opportunities and enrichment Google Classroom. I've had some of my students that, that approach me about it and uh, they post opportunities regularly. So it's just something that students that are interested in have to keep up with and if they're interested, we most certainly we can help them along with it. But we don't individually say apply to X or apply to Y, but we can certainly help them through the process. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? No? Okay, now Ms. Smith. Hello, thank you again for coming. Uh, I also want to just say when you're looking for summer programs, sometimes I found some of the best, I've stumbled across things by just doing a Google search on summer high school architecture. My oldest son is a senior in an architecture program and my second son is in a physician assistant program. So. I've been through this and I get it. So buckle in, <laughs> buckle into high school. College basics. Yes, the college application is not until senior year, but it's nice to start thinking ahead of time for some of the resources that are available and start planning ahead. Um, again, visit colleges informally. When you're driving past, take a visit. Go to a college hockey game. Visit a show, even just driving by. Sometimes just getting a sense for what feels right for me. What is the vibe on campus if you walk around? Or what feels right for me? Am I okay with a bigger school, a smaller school, city, suburban? Sometimes just starting to get the visual of what that might look like is helpful. Score is helpful, virtual tours. Most colleges, thanks to COVID, have now um, have a lot of virtual tours. So that can be very helpful. TikTok, YouTube has also been somewhat helpful. Um, but that's, you have to really be careful with the sources, like anything on TikTok and YouTube. So I will say, in terms of fairs, there is a handout in the back. And next Wednesday in the, um, is it the high school or is it the, at the Reading High School, there's a college fair. And I have found it to be a tremendous resource because most of your children have no idea what college is all about. And it's rows and rows of UMass Amherst at this end of the table, UMass Lowell at this end, UMass Boston. And just walk by and you can see pictures, look at the list of majors, ask questions. What does it mean to major in engineering? When do I have to decide? What does living on campus mean? And these, the admissions people who run this, they're just thrilled to, to answer whatever questions your children have. Um, other college sources, if you're looking for um, schools who have whatever, are the College Board, Big Future, or the ACT student website. Um, also, it's speaking of college, when you're looking at summer programs, a lot of the colleges in the area do have a lot of programs specifically designed for high school students to explore, including community colleges in the area. What kinds of things are colleges going to be looking for, just so you can start kind of getting your head around it? Of course, grades. They want to know, are you ready to handle the workload for college? And I'll show you what a transcript looks like in just a minute. Extracurriculars, what do you do in your spare time? What are you passionate about? What are you interested in? Colleges are, would like to see people who are going to contribute. Are you a good fit for them? And this is one of the ways they look at is what do you do in your spare time? It also shows them what you're going to offer to their school because they can look and say, did they, did they get involved? Are they active? What are they going to contribute to our college community? Letters of recommendation, it says 11th and 12th grade teachers, but honestly, one can even be in the 10th grade. So those of you with 10th graders or rising 10th graders can also start thinking about the teachers who know you well and can say some things about you. And particularly the competitive colleges are going to want our counselor recommendation. That's usually a requirement as well. Demonstrated interest. They want to see how interested you are in them, and one of the ways is by signing up to go on a tour with them. 
interacting with them, email them. There's many schools who track that kind of stuff. Um, thoughtful application rather than just like something thrown together, but that's going down the road. Standardized tests, uh, Ms. Minji is going to get into that a little bit later. Um, so, transcript. Oh, let me also comment. When we're talking about extracurriculars, some people think you need to have 52 activities that you do. We encourage all of our students, think about quality rather than quantity. No one wants somebody who's got 52 activities but doesn't show up to them. You'd rather have depth and think about it that way. What are you passionate about? Get, what are you passionate about? Pursue it. Take, um, take initiative and leadership roles in those. So on the transcript. Top of the transcript, it just has basic information. Notice on the right, it says weighted GPA. In the high school and, in high school and college, they operate on the 4.0 system. A is a four, B is a three, C is a two, D is a one. We'll show you a, a chart in just a second that goes through that as well. And I'll show you what the weight of that means. Um, and it tells the accumulated credits. Here's the middle, the crux of what they're looking at. Colleges are looking at what did you take, what levels, did you challenge yourself, are your grades on the upward trend, or are you going the wrong direction? Um, they notice on here, it tells only the final grade. So we consistently tell our students, if you need help, get help. After school, Tuesdays and Thursdays, there's a late bus. Before school, after school, till 3, 15, 3, 20, teachers are around. If you need help, get help. Go during the flex block. Um, what else? Yep, and then at the bottom it tells, so, and then all of these are averaged together to come up with a grade point average. I'm sorry, Joe, can you go back? There's some who would like a, they're taking pictures. Oh. <laughs> uh, the, the, the picture in your hand is a little small, I get it. Okay. Okay. Bottom of the transcript is just a, a, a code to read, a, a key for reading it. Okay. Uh, Ms. Diaz is not here. Okay. So remember, when you look in the far right column on the college prep, that's the A is the 4, B is the 3, C is the 2, 1 is the D. And if, but when you noticed on the transcript it said weighted grade point average, if you challenge yourself and take something at the honors level, it'll still say B on your transcript, but in figuring out the overall grade point average, this is the weight that goes into it. Instead of the 3.0 in an honors class, 3.5 is figured into that. Okay? And so this would be for the, the 10th grade families. Lisa, can you just make sure this is how we calculate Yes, this is how we calculate GPA. And generally, this is also how Massachusetts state schools, public colleges, the, the, the public colleges compute your, trans, or compute your grade point average. Private schools, they have a very highly secretive version of how they figure these things out. So that's not necessarily how they do it. Um, freshman, fa freshman families, what we've changed is, remember how Mrs. Wittasek had mentioned that the dual enrollment classes and the AP classes that are taken at the college level, those get a full extra point. Now, you may be thinking, I want my child to take 16 AP classes before they graduate. Well, it does your child no good if they're taking all these classes but not doing well. You have to find the balance for you. It does not help your cause if you're taking AP classes and getting C's and you're overreaching. It just is evidence for a college that you're not ready for whatever. So find the balance for you. Okay. School profile, when you saw the transcript, what we send to colleges along with the transcript is kind of a, a, a just an explanation of what our community is like. Um, what the graduation requirements are, why certain things might say non-level, like health and gym, um, what the curriculum is, the plans, what percentage of our students go to four-year, two-year colleges, and things like this. What's the highest GPA, the average GPA, just so they can get a sense of what, what our community is like. Okay. What questions do you have about all of that? 
I know now. This is called the permanent record. So, look it up. All set? Okay. Ms. Minty? <laughs> So I'm going to continue talking about some of those other parts of what colleges are looking at. And um, Ms. Smith already said a bit about extracurricular activities. Here, I think we're just adding, um, you know, in general, it, it's a focus on their activities during their high school years. Sorry, I'm trying to find the right, the right microphone height. Um, we will help them create an official list during their junior year, but it it's, doesn't hurt to start keeping track of what they're doing during ninth and 10th grade. Though honestly, like Ms. Smith said, as far as it, if it's something that by junior year, you can't even remember that you did it, in my opinion, it probably doesn't really belong on your activity list anyway. Your activity list for college really should emphasize those things that you've been really involved in and really passionate about. So it's okay if it's just a few things. It's also, I find a lot of my students might feel like they, they come thinking, oh, I need a leadership position, I need volunteering, I need you know everything. But really when colleges are reviewing these, they don't expect every student to be every kind of person. They're just looking at, they want to build their community. Some of those students maybe will be focused on athletics. Others are focused on volunteering and service. Others are leaders. So you don't have to have everything. Um, the specifically too at the bottom it mentions adopt a class hours is, is a separate thing so um, it's it's less of an extracurricular activity to be honest but I think we we're just trying to find the right right place to put it in our presentation just to make sure everyone's aware the, those are specific events in the community that students can volunteer for while they're in high school and if, if they volunteer for a minimum number of hours by, by the time they're up their senior year, they will be guaranteed a scholarship in the Adopt-a-Class program. We have many, many other scholarships too, so this is just one of many scholarships they can earn, but the minimum would be to uh, volunteer for specific Adopt-a-Class events for a minimum of two hours each year that they're in high school. If you have a 10th grader here and you say, uh-oh, my, my son or daughter did not know about this last year and they missed that year, they can make up for the hours. They just have to get double the amount of hours, unfortunately. So, so if they don't do ninth grade, they, just, they would need um, 16 hours minimum as opposed to eight hours minimum. Um, and our, one of our assistants, our registrar, Ms. Kavanaugh, she is the Adopt-a-Class advisor. So if students have questions about it, they should just come to the counseling department and ask her. She can let them know if there might be events coming up. They're typically um, part of the daily announcements, which are also posted on the high school website. It's called the Daily Bulletin, I believe, on there. Um, but, and if they do more than the minimum hours, they just earn even a higher scholarship. So it's just a, a handy thing to know about, but by no means is, none of these are graduation requirements. I think many students lately also seem, some seem to think that we have a, a volunteer requirement. We, we do not. So volunteering is a wonderful thing to do, but it is not a graduation requirement. Yes? Mm -hmm. as to what adopt class is and as far like if you're new to Burlington mm -hmm. it's very unclear and it's almost like if you have a conflict during certain things it's like it keeps being penalized so I, I can't speak in great detail to the program unfortunately but my impression is there there is a mix of opportunities so some are yes like a on weekends or where, where students may have conflicts, but actually they've increased opportunities now even where they may not have to be face-to-face -face things. Sometimes people can participate in fundraisers or other, other kind of options. Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, and I think you, you've looked at that website, it sounds like, right? But, oh no, okay. So, yeah, just it's part, <laughs> part of the scholarship um, part of the website there. Just so list. Yeah, yeah. We don't have to go through the whole thing. Honestly, it's a very small part of the whole picture. Again, there we actually have over, what is it, how many scholarships, separate scholarships do we have? Eight, at least 80 plus. Oh, so, you know, probably give about 120 different scholarships. 
Yeah. We're hearing like more like 120. So adopt a class is just one of 120 different scholarship opportunities. We just mention it in particular because it's a, a unique opportunity. It's under, it's under counseling. Yeah. So within the counseling department site, down under scholarships, um, that that would be where you could find more information. But even with that information, I think the level you're mentioning, you, you probably it would be helpful just to call or email Teresa Kavanaugh, who's the advisor. Okay. <laughs> just reorganizing that, no problem. So so because it was next on the list of what colleges are looking at, just going to try to give you real basics about the standardized testing. So it's a very small part of the process at this point in time, but 10th graders at Burlington High School, every 10th grader automatically takes the practice of the SAT exam, which is called the PSAT. So. Um, that is during the school day. You don't have to do anything extra to sign up for it. So you have a ninth grader now, they will be taking it next October. If you have a 10th grader right now, they took it this October. Um, and we just had at the bottom of the slide too, uh, you know, I, I don't know if and when that would change. It's been many, many years that that's the test the students have been taking, but, but yeah, we can't predict changes that may come. Um, and there are many test prep companies out there, but the one, we just have a partnership with a, a company called Kaplan Test Prep. So we send information about uh, prep classes that they offer and Burlington families do get discounts for that, those programs. But during sophomore year, the only thing to really think about is just, just practicing. Um, it, that score does not go to colleges. It's really just between the parent, the student, and the counselor that see it. And then moving into junior year. So junior year is the year when you really take either the SAT or the ACT, which if your college requires it or if you do well on it, that, that would be the actual score that you could choose to send to colleges. Um, there is an opportunity that we would recommend of retaking the PSAT also in junior year. It's optional there, so students do have to sign up for it and pay a small fee for it in junior year. Um, but then SAT and ACT, we have another slide that's just going to break down the difference between the two exams, but they're one or the other is all you need for college. One is not considered better than the other and the time to take them is the end of junior year. Um, then AP exams are offered there in May on specific dates depending on what a, a, a class you're in. Senior year, there is time to retake your SAT or ACT if you would like to in the fall. Um, and again, there are, the AP exams would be in May. Um, one other thing that's just something to be aware of, particularly if um, your, your child hasn't always been in Burlington, or yet particularly has moved from another country. Some colleges do require an exam just to show English proficiency. Um, sometimes even if you moved five, or five years ago, they may still require um, most commonly either a test called the TOEFL or Duolingo, but um, you would want to check individual websites about that. Okay, so more about the SAT, ACT, and I guess this is even less about SAT and ACT, but more about just the reality that right now, actually almost no colleges require these tests. And um, even before COVID, it was trending in that direction, but COVID really changed everything, where for the last few years, most students have not needed SAT or ACT for the colleges they're applying to, and most students haven't sent their scores as part of their application because most colleges have had either a test blind policy, like all the University of California schools, they won't even look at a score if you want to send it to them. Um, most other schools are test optional, which means your application won't be harmed if you don't send a score, but if you did really well, you have the option to send it if you'd like to, and they'll consider it as a small part of your application. Um, this does, I feel like right now, <laughs> we're starting to see a shift a little bit a few years after COVID where this past month, 
um, Columbia and Dartmouth both, and, or maybe it wasn't, yeah, Yale and Dartmouth, I'm sorry, both announced that they are going to start requiring um, SAT or ACT again next year. But so far, other than that, MIT and Georgetown have also required it for the last couple years. Public universities in Georgia and Florida have required them, but no others that our students commonly apply to currently require them. Um, I think with you all having ninth and 10th graders, there is a high likelihood that by the time they're applying to college, there will be at least a few more schools starting to require it again, but we just can't fully predict it. I, I predict it, it won't go all the way back to all the ones that used to require it, but there probably will be a few more. And the list, it's always best to look at the individual college websites that you're interested in for the full, their full policies. But there is also a website called fairtest.org that just keeps an updated list of which colleges are and are not test optional. Um, and I guess just an addition about the PSATs is if you do have a 10th grader who took it this year, their score is hopefully they already have looked at them and they received information in the winter. Um, but they can access their scores and you know, guided practice on the College Board website, which is the company that runs the PSAT and SAT. Okay, so more of a side-by-side -side comparison of the SAT and ACT. Again, they're equally valid tests. Colleges have no preference. Our students are just typically more familiar with the SAT um, because traditionally in the East, it was the more popular test. That um, past years though, ACT has really surged and there were actually some years recently where nationwide more students took the ACT than the SAT. It's really just a matter of preference for the student, which one is a better match for their skills and which they're more comfortable with. Um, but the, they're similar in many ways. The highlights of the differences are um, the SAT, looking at the total score part, SAT has one math score and one English score, let's call it. It's reading and writing. So 50% of your score is math, 50% of your score is English. ACT, 50% of your score is still English, but math is only 25% of the score. And ACT has a, a science section as well, which the SAT does not. So science is 25% of the score on the ACT. So math is half as much of your score on the ACT as it is on the SAT, and there is no science score on the SAT. The other most huge difference right now is that um, now the SAT started, just started this year, it's only offered online. Um, the ACT continues to be a paper test, and that in itself might not sound like as big a difference, but the, the big difference now is in the way the tests are scored, the paper ACT versus the digital SAT. So the adaptive testing is the key part to understand on the left about the SAT. What that means is there's two parts, module one and module two now. This is totally different than how it has always been on the paper version. But in module one, the students all have a mix of easy, medium, and hard questions but based on how they do on those easy, medium, and hard questions, the level of questions they're asked on the second module will be either the easier version or the harder version. And if they uh, are in the easier version, the maximum score that they can earn is, is lower. It's only you know, maybe under 1,200. If they're tracked into the harder version, that's where they can earn the, the much higher score. The ACT on paper right now is still just every question is, is weighted equally. So it doesn't matter which, which questions you get right or wrong, easy, medium, or hard, they're all weighted equally. Now ACT probably is gonna move toward, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to move toward digital in the future as well, but as of right now, the, this is the stark difference. Um, and as far as just the logistics, again, of when, when you would take it and how you register, it's not something you, you only take the practice, and by the way, the ACT does also offer a practice test. It's called the plan. We just don't, um, you know, we don't offer it to all our students and pull them out of class for a day like we do with the PSAT, but it is something you could look into if you wanted to try that um, practice ACT. Again, it's called the plan, P-L-A-N. Um, but the 
actual SAT or ACT, they should not take until the second half of their junior year. And then how you register for those exams is just on the website for whichever test you're interested in. We just wanted to also point out that um, you, know, you do normally have to pay, it's around $60 for the tests, but if you're eligible for free or reduced lunch, you can get a waiver so that you don't have to pay. It would be free. And if, if that's a great, great thing to do, not only to save that $60, but if, if you do that, you're also eligible for a fee waiver for college applications in the future too, because those also would otherwise cost money. Um, the prep, test prep, like you mentioned, Kaplan is, is a company that we work with where they offer traditional classes, but preparation that you do on your own is just as good as long as you are committed to it. So, you know, in, in my own preparation, I just, I know I got a SAT prep book and I just worked through it and made sure that I took my practice exams. That type of preparation is not any, um, any worse than, than taking a class. I think it's just a matter of, you know, you know your sons or daughters, what, what's a better setting for them? Are, are they, um, you know, better in a class setting or are they better working independently through prepping? Um, but also, right now, again, most colleges, almost, you know, 99% are test optional, so I also wouldn't recommend getting obsessed with this when really, even when, when it's required, the grades are always more important than the test scores, so that should always be the primary focus. Um, and, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I guess just when to, yeah. When to send scores, right now if it's test optional, you would only send your scores if, if they're impressive for the college that you're applying to. And then the next last slide that I have, it's, it's actually kind of a moot point at this point, but it's just showing you that there was a transition from the paper to the online SAT. So um, this year, in the fall, seniors were still taking the paper version. But starting this winter, there's no more paper version and it's all digital. So all our juniors took the digital and your ninth and 10th graders, if they take the SAT, their only option is digital. Um, before I pass it back to Ms. Stradivato, does anyone have questions about the extracurriculars or tests? Yes. So regarding those colleges that require SAT or ACT, is there a preference for those colleges or it's always on and school? Never a preference. I think, yeah. Oh, sure, yes. So the question was whether colleges have a preference between either the SAT or the ACT. And when I started as a counselor, you know, 15 years ago, there were maybe 1% that had a preference. Now I don't know of any. So they all completely equal. So it's really just based on whichever test the student would get a higher score on. That, that's the one they should focus on. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah. Anything else? Okay, then I'm gonna give it back to Mr. Adubato. Thank you. Just a couple of points I'd like to make. Oh, I forgot, actually. Oh, was I supposed to no, this is gonna, I'm gonna do this. Okay. We're just uh, jumping back a page in, this, in, the, um, in the packet, but just a couple of points I just wanted to make quickly. One was in regard to Kaplan test prep. Uh, Burlington High School has worked with Kaplan te test prep since the late 90s, um, and they offer subsidized uh, opportunities for our students. So any Burlington High School student can take a test prep class for a reduced rate. But it is for juniors and seniors. I did want to let you know that. Um, <clears throat> it is an option if, you, if a student chooses to do that. They have test prep opportunities. They're all online. They're not traditional classes anymore. Um, but again, I just wanted to make sure we clarified that. And then with the uh, uh, PSATs. We do use the PSAT um, scores for something called AP Potential, and students can look now actually if they log into their account, um, or if parents who do that with their, your students. They, what, what the uh, PSAT does is with the results of those scores, they show whether or not a student has uh, potential in particular AP classes. So that's a good avenue to take a look to see kind of, you know, Again, standardized testing isn't, isn't the only piece of information used, but it could be some good information for you to look at when you're looking at the score reports. So we were just going to jump, and I apologize, it got a little out of order in the packet, but um, Ms. Minty was talking about the basics of college, and we wanted to continue with that. 
Um, but we did want to just mention a little bit about college and college expectations in terms of courses that students should take while in high school. Um, the Burlington High School graduation requirements, um, the way our graduation requirements are set up, they are um, in alignment with the Mass Public Colleges and Universities. In fact, we exceed their requirements in, uh, in two different areas. Um, sorry, one area now. Right. And the state schools, I think, are only two years. But um, so, the Massachusetts public colleges and universities, because you pay taxes in the state, uh, they are more transparent about their process. So, the Mass Higher Ed website lists how the state schools go about reviewing uh, applications and transcripts in the process about recalculating their GPA. So that's right on the Mass Higher Ed website, you could Google it and see, but they will look at a Burlington High School student and they will use just the classes that they require and recalculate the GPA. So what we found over the years, we've looked at uh, state schools, we've looked at private schools, competitive, all different types of colleges, and we weighed out what these colleges were looking for. So we found what some of the more competitive colleges are looking for, uh, four years of the five core subjects. When we say five, that fifth would be like a world language class, whether it be Italian, French, Spanish, Latin, whatever the case may be. Math through senior year, which again, we re require that anyway in our school. We require students to take math every year, but colleges want to see students in math senior year. Three or four years of that world language, honors or AP courses, and um, colleges, you know, and I tell students this often, that if there's a particular college they were interested in, Google it and see what exactly do they require? What specific things do they require? Do they want you to take a, a physics class? So again, it's important to know that, especially around this time of the year when you're planning for courses, because uh, you want to make sure you're enrolling in the appropriate classes. Is it the California system that requires fine arts? So the California system requires fine arts, and I know it's hard to predict whether or not you're gonna to apply to a California school, but again, it's just good to be aware of that type of thing. And then, nope, there was one more, oh, I sorry. think. Is there one more? Oh, okay. So now, bear with us. So any questions on that, on the competitive colleges um, that we just went over, the Mass Higher Ed website? And the state, the state colleges, that, as of right now, they don't require um, SATs. And then Salem State and maybe one other state school is actually requiring SATs for nursing. And then I think that changed this year as well. They're not requiring um, the SATs for a nursing program. Did someone have a question? Can you, can you go back to the slide for this one? About the, the one for, the, the, yeah. <laughs> Fine arts. So it doesn't just have to be, it could be a music class, it could be an art class. Yes. Yep. Again, the state schools, California as well, they, they're pretty transparent about what they're looking for. You can go right to the website to, to check that out. California doesn't sound bad about right now with the weather. The NCAA, so the NCAA, they offer scholarships, athletic scholarships to students. Um, it's division one or two. So where they offer scholarships throughout the country, they are very transparent about what they look at for students. They try to put all students on a level playing field. So they review all these high schools around the country, they review all the curriculum of each school. And they approve or not approve classes that we offer. And so if a student was thinking about participating in a Division I or II college program, they need to make sure they adhere to the NCAA Clearinghouse. So for example, they do not count any business or computer science class. I don't agree with it, but again, they don't require that. They want students to take uh, more of the math, science, history, world language core classes. Uh, so again, this is something uh, you would want to discuss with the, your child's counselor just to make sure that you are on the right track. So 
mo most of our students are fine with the NCAA because they don't require as much as we do at our high school. So again, I think our high school graduation requirements exceed what they're looking for, but it is something to be aware of. If a student's participating in Division Three, it, it is, um, you know, they don't offer scholarships at Division Three, so students don't need to adhere to the academic portion of this because they're not receiving any money. Uh, this is really just applies to Division One or Two. So some of the things that uh, ninth and tenth graders can be doing now, uh, obviously talking to teachers. That's what's happening now through the course selection process. One-to-one -one meetings, one of the counselors mentioned earlier, but uh, your son or daughter will be meeting with a counselor. We organize this, or we, by Ms., by when I say we, I mean Miss Minty, organizes this, uh, this two-week time frame where students are coming down to the counseling department and they're having uh, quick mini-meetings with their counselor for about 10 or 15 minutes to discuss the course selection process, quick questions, that type of thing. We found that. This is our third year doing this. We find it. Uh, a challenge to organize, but very well worth it, especially for the students. They have that opportunity to get some individual questions answered. Looking at the program of studies, we've talked about PSAT results for those currently in grade 10. Use score, again, an introductory email will be sent out. Parents, if you want to access the program, we have a sheet right in back you can fill out and leave it here. We'll make sure you get a, an email with um, access information. Begin to look at colleges, of course, with technology, with Google, with um, ability to access thousands of colleges around the country. It's very uh, easy to take a look at different types of colleges. Summer, whether it be employment, enrichment activities, whatever the case may be, we really encourage students to, to find something they're passionate about and that they're interested in and really try to pursue that, uh, especially in the summer months. And then you heard Ms. Minty just talk a little bit about leadership roles. Again, not everyone can be a, the president of a club. However, you know, every participation, I think, is, is a big piece as well. So really trying to look at a role within a club and trying to identify something that um, student is passionate about. Again, that's, that's a key piece. So we do, like, we do like to talk, well, I don't know if like is the right word, but stress and anxiety. We do talk about it quite a bit, and it is, it is a normal part of high school experience, or it's a normal part of life, right? We all have stresses, we all have to deal with them, and sometimes it can be challenging. And so I think that you need to recognize that it's going to be stressful sometimes, going through this process over the next few years. It's, it's inevitable. Um, it's just in, in how you deal and cope with it, and so we want to make sure you're aware of any supports if it gets to a point where you feel like it might be unmanageable. Uh, again, we want students to be aware of that. I do think one way to avoid a lot of that stress, though, is just um, being organized and having an idea of the process and what's coming. So I think that's a big piece, which is why we try to have all these nights and events to try to reduce that stress. Um, again, you know, I think as parents sometimes with our children, when we hear some of the issues they're dealing with, we don't see them as that big of a deal sometimes, right? But they really are, they're right in, in the moment, so meeting students where they're at, learning and modeling any kind of uh, stress and management skills, supporting involvement in sports and clubs, so that's a great way for students to relieve stress um, is through our clubs, and we'll share this slideshow with everyone after, but. We have a link, Ms. Minty, if you could just click on that, to the clubs and activities that we offer, uh, which is pretty cool. You can see all the different clubs and activities that we offer. We had an activity fair in September. Students had the opportunity to meet with some of these clubs. So I'd really encourage you, when we, uh, when we share this, you want to click on this link and check it out. I know that, uh, again, Lots of students at this point are, are participating in these clubs, but there may be something on there uh, that, that is uh, of interest. So again, just the supports at Burlington High School, not just in the social emotional sense, but obviously this academic planning, school counselor, we wanna be your first stop. 
We work with lots of uh, local agencies as well. Interface, it's uh, an agency that you can call, go through um, an intake over the phone, and that would be for any kind of mental health support. You go through an intake, it's about 15 minutes, and they can help identify a uh, mental health professional in the area. It's, uh, it's a free service uh, for the entire community. Right in town, Burlington Youth and Family Services, they are, I think, you know, are they still in the rec center in that area? next door to the rec center. So yeah, right in town, we have a, um, a staff of mental health professionals that are available to anyone in the community. Of course, we have Lady Clinic, Family Counseling Associates, and Advocates. These are all agencies that we work with, with uh, mental health professionals that are available to students and parents. A Couple of upcoming things, so the college fair. You should have got an email about it tonight. We have a flyer in the back. Uh, Burlington High School, we co-sponsor this with a few other schools in the Middlesex League. And again, I think Mrs. Smith talked about it, but it's a great opportunity to experience a college fair. Uh, in the email we sent out, we, we included a link to some, some helpful tips. So I would I encourage you to check, check out that email. We'll have a financial aid overview night on June 6th, and then for those that are parents of students in grade 10, you can come back here again next year around this time and we'll, t we'll really get into the, the nitty gritty college application process. We didn't get into the, into the weeds on the actual process uh, this year because right now in grade 10, it's really not something that would be appropriate. And then before we open it up for any questions, there was an, I think it's orange. Is it orange? It's an orange sheet. It was uh, on the table when you came in. Uh, we'd ask you to fill that out. Please uh, provide us some feedback. And the score sign-up sheet, which was also on the table, if you'd like to get access to the score program, we'd ask you to fill that out as well. And you would get an auto email to whatever email you list. And you can begin to take a look at that program as well. Okay, yes, question. When do the recommendations post on Aspen, and do we have opportunities to reach out to teachers, counselors, if we feel that we want our kids to maybe try a harder or lower class before they get posted? So the question is, um, when can parents view the recommendations on Aspen? They're viewable now. Um, if you go into, if you log in to your Aspen account uh, and go to click on the info tab, down below there's something that says requests. You can see that information now. In terms of, um, you know, taking a class that maybe a higher or lower level, I would absolutely start with the teacher first, depending on what that recommendation is. If you feel or your child feels that they'd like to take an honors and challenge themselves, that type of thing. Again, start with the teacher first. Then you can certainly connect with us. We do have an override process, so that would mean um, the teacher really feels strongly that the student should take a certain level course. Uh, again, we want to make sure everyone's clear as to why that is, but if you would still want to continue with that, we would go through what's called an override process, which is essentially a form we have you sign, have the family sign, the student sign, just to acknowledge that, and then we could make that adjustment. And keep in mind right now, kids are going through the course request process. This is just requesting what they'd like to take. All right, and then from there, once the request process is over, we would then build a schedule. Our whole high school schedule is predicated on requests of students, and we try to build it around that. So we give students a couple of weeks to think about it. It's primarily around the electives where students uh, do a lot of the thought process. But again, keep that in mind, the students have until the 18th to make their selections. Yes. Is 
almost too late. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we would not do that. We would, we would work with you, but uh, I'll be honest, it really is a disruption to the student because in some cases they have to change their schedule. And I think a student gets into the school year and gets comfortable and that type of thing, and then we have to make an adjustment. We also ask students to stay in the class for the first half of the quarter. So if a student came down day three requesting to change a level, we would, we would say no, not at this time. Um, you were recommended or signed up for it, you, you have to see how it plays out. We found over the years that halfway point makes a difference, meaning once the student gets settled in, oftentimes they feel like they're able to manage it and it works out. Um, however, having said that, we, we don't want students to be in a situation where they're not learning and it's going beyond them. So we would want to, obviously we want to avoid that from happening, but if we are in that moment, we would certainly take a look to see the mitigating factors and then potentially make a change. Another thing I'll say is before you override a class, I would have a conversation with the teacher and say, why are you not, why do you feel strongly that you don't approve the honors? And have your child sit down with that teacher and work with that teacher. And the teachers can change their mind later on and sometimes they'll say, let's give it some time. It's now the beginning of, of March. Where are they by the end of April? and see where you are and sometimes when you know your child is working very hard from now to the end of, of April, that's a, a good sense for if that is going to be the appropriate level for them or rather than overriding it and jumping on that too soon. Oh, I have one more thought of this, I'm just thinking too. So I do sometimes have cases where students override and it works out, but to be honest, the vast majority it doesn't, and so there usually is a reason. The teacher is really trying their best to predict what is the class where that student will be able to get A's and B's, which is what the colleges want to see. So if you remember when we looked at the chart of the weighted GPA, if you're getting lower grades in honors and AP courses, not only is it going to hurt your GPA, but the colleges also do see those letter grades, and generally they want to see mostly A's and B's. So, so that's the thing to, to make sure is if, if you're, and you know, there may be some times when, um, like Ms. Smith said, between now and the end of the year, they're, they're, there's improvement that they're making and the teacher may then say, yeah, you know what, now I really do think they would be successful in honors or AP, but generally there's a reason right now if they're not recommending it, it's important to know what that reason is and just weigh it carefully before you would decide to override the course. That's just all I wanted to add. Yes? No, but we would want a parent to be aware, so we would probably ask uh, however that plays out, whether the, you know, um, through an, we could probably do that even through an email. Just we want to make sure a parent is aware. Any other, yes? It depends. So in our English department, our English department would say they're all covering the same, same curriculum. I think it's just how in depth they get, the homework expectations, um, the rigor of the course, the writing. I think I think it, it's those types of things for for English. I think math is is you know a little bit different because math requires prerequisite knowledge to get to certain points. I think math. I think the pacing is is different as well. Um, so there's not an exact answer. We do have descriptions around that in our program of studies. Um, but I do think for students making the jump into an honors, um, you know, being passionate and really being passionate about the subject area I think is a big help. Um, you know, and having an interest in learning and being willing to make the commitment because again the homework expectations are going to be probably um, a little bit more, but it is dependent on the student's, student's ability as well. Could I just add another layer to it? I think in most courses, a, a key difference between CP and honors and what I shared with my students is in the CP level, 
um, the teachers do spend more time making sure that they review material and really break it down um, and follow at a pace according to what, what the students need. The honors level is the expectation is a lot more independent learning for the students. So, you know, they'll assign a reading and the expectation is everyone learns it at home and then they come to class and they may build upon that base knowledge. So if sometimes, you know, students feel like, hey, my teacher is not breaking this down. To be honest, in most honors courses, that is the expectation is they, they wouldn't break it down as much because at that level they're expecting that student to to do a lot more of the independent foundation and then they're, they're moving at a faster pace and they're breaking it down a little less. And then at the AP level, it's even a you know, much a higher jump because AP courses are designed to be equivalent to college level courses. So they cover material at a much faster pace and with an expectation that a lot more work is, is done independently outside of school. You know, so when I, I took AP Bio, decades ago actually, <laughs> but I remember spending at least an hour or two every day on my, just my AP Bio class, reading, reading the textbook, you know, um, many pages, not just five or ten pages, taking notes on what I was reading and reviewing those notes is kind of the level of what's expected to keep up at the pace in an AP course. Honors much less so than that, but still significantly more than, than CP. Even with weighting in an AP, the, the grade weighting in the AP classes, it's still probably better to get a higher grade in an average class than a middle grade in an AP course. I think that's subject a little bit of subjectivity there. So and it's a big yeah, and I don't we don't have an exact answer. We that question has been asked for years, and I I think that colleges like to see a higher GPA. I mean, but I think in terms of, of, um, of learning, the student has to really, if they're in that AP class and they're getting a B or a C and they're really struggling to do that and to keep up, I don't think that would be um, well served for that student. I tell my students, preserve your GPA. So whatever that means, preserve your GPA. However, you also need to be aware that the more competitive the college, they're going to, the more likely they are going to look at Holy Cross monitors if we have, if the highest level of, of you can take in English is AP this and this, have you taken them? How much have you maximized the potential of what your school has? That's when it comes into play. Now let's keep in mind, these schools we're talking about, like the Harvards and the Yales and these, I mean, they have a 4% acceptance rate. Now take out a lot of other factors that go into that. It's very, very hard to get into these schools. It's highly rejective. So you, but, but there are a big chunk of schools that are still very competitive and very strong. So you want to challenge yourself, but you need to find out where that right balance is for you. Does that make sense? Yeah. So preserve the GPA. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, I'm going to hang out here for a couple of minutes. If you have any questions you didn't want to ask in front of the crowd or BCAT. Um, so again, thank you all for coming tonight. We really appreciate it. Enjoy your night. Thank you.